so my task today is to respond to what Muriel has said. And usually when lawyers, you know, being asked for opinion, there is dispute. I have to disappoint you because I actually agree with most of what she has said. So this is going to be boring. Um, I think the main purpose of my talk will be to say that I think the ideas presented are very sensible and good. My point would be that I think the law is not as sensible. And I think we still have some ways to go to actually use the framework in a way that it's meaningful and actually fulfills the purpose that Mirel has um, lined out for us. So um, what I want to do is talk a bit about, I think, three, three main points that uh, from your paper and from your talk, talking a bit about the principles of the GDPR and what that means and how it actually could work in practice and what the law actually says that needs to be done. And then focus a bit about contesting because as you said, that's probably the key thing. That's gonna be the key thing that could actually enhance accountability and see what the GDPR requires you to do that in order to make AI more accountable. Okay, then let's start with um, the principles that are in the GDPR in Article 5 that are now legally binding. Um, at first look, they look great, right? Nobody's going to disagree with any of those things because they seem very positive. If you look at it a bit closer, it seems that's really hard to find and as a lawyer, I really like to define things. So let's start with the first one, uh, lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. Lawfulness. Nobody's going to disagree with that. And I think it's kind of weird that you need to put the word lawfulness in the law, reminding you that you need to follow the law that you just have written. But OK, um, one of what the lawfulness things that Mirella also mentioned is consent. So this is the, the legitimate basis to start data collection, data processing. Um, I have to say I've never been a great fan of consent, not because I think it's a bad idea. I think it's just very impractical and does not really work in practice, mainly because People don't really read um, terms and conditions. It just, you know, click, accept. Um, so I'm not quite sure if there's actually a very good mechanism. Maybe we need to think about something else. Not to say we don't need data protection, that I think we need, but we meet, might need something that is more feasible. Um, the other principle is fairness. Let's be fair. If I tell you be fair from now on, you know exactly what to do, right? There is no dispute over what fairness actually means. There's a clear definition of fairness. We have all consensus about that. Fairness will never change. Yeah? It's a static system. What has been fair is now fair, was now fair, will be fair forever. No problems whatsoever, right? So, well, I think that's a major problem because we don't actually agree on any terminology for fairness. If you ask philosophers, if you have two philosophers what fairness means, you get seven answers. <laughs> and that's one of the problems that we see here. Um, the other thing is transparency, which all sounds really good too, right? But again, there is so much information. Do you really need to know everything that is happening behind the algorithm? Are you really interested in that? Of course, you don't want to have a closed system where you don't know what's going on. But as you mentioned, do you really enjoy the cookie notifications? Is that, you know, is that the thing about transparency that you're really keen about? I'm not quite sure. Um, maybe we need to think about transparency in a different way rather than having all those notifications all the time. Um, purpose limitation. That makes very much sense from a um, data protection perspective. And I think there is some truth to it that we need to have something in mind what we want to do with the data. But the question is, if you talk to machine learning people, they will scream. Because machine learning means that you learn something new about the data that you didn't know about. That's the whole idea. You learn something. So the question of, Predefining a purpose could be challenging, right? So there's some tension between what lawyers want and machine learning people want. I'm not saying that either parties are right. I'm just saying there's some tension here. I guess the same comes true for data minimization. We are living in the world of big data, not small data, right? So that means the idea that you only collect as little data as possible is kind of not what machine learning and big data society wants. Again, not having a solution. They're just saying there's some tension here. Um, a very important principle is the principle of accuracy. That means you should have, uh, the data controller has the obligation to make sure that the data that they're collecting is accurate and complete, which sounds good. And also the data subject has the right to not only know what data is being held about them, but also get it rectified if it's wrong or get it completed. That's going to be maybe very burdensome if you have like a company that has millions, millions of data points. You have an obligation to curate your data set constantly. Make sure that it's up to date, accurate, 
and complete. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work in practice because data cleaning is obviously a big task. Not to say you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying there is some work to be done here. Um, storage limitation. That means deleted data as soon as you don't need it anymore. I've never heard that anybody who's working in big data machine learning deletes their data. <laughs> we don't do that. We keep the data for as long as possible because we might need it for other purposes. And that's, that's a problem, too. Um, so we might need to rethink how data protection law works. Um, integrity and confidentiality. That very much leads to the question of who should have access to that data. Cybersecurity standards, encryption, and all of that. And there is now an obligation to make sure that those systems are being secured. GDPR doesn't really give you a baseline for what's legally required. So you need to make sure it's safe, but you don't know if, you're gonna, if, if you have reached that bar. right? So there's some kind of vagueness there that we need to address. And then this lovely um, principle of accountability. Accountability means that data controller has to show compliance with the law, that they have privacy by default sign and privacy default mechanisms. Again, we don't know what that means. It doesn't, the law doesn't say this is the thing that you need to do. It just say privacy by design, privacy by default. And um, data protection impact assessment is also a mechanism of accountability where there are some problems with that um, because it might just be a one-off thing and not a cyclical thing. But again, those principles are here, and I think they have a justification to be here. I think there needs to be, if we take this seriously, as you said, we might need to rethink how we design systems, and we need to maybe you know, go a, back, a step back and think about new ways of collecting data and evaluating them, at least if we take this seriously. Um, the second thing that that you mentioned is the right to contest. And I think that's going to be very powerful if we play it right. Um, so as, as you mentioned in your talk, we have now the right to contest decisions in Article 22 if they are solely automated and if they have similar uh, legal significant effects. We talked about the solely automated part as well. I want to talk about what legal and significant effects mean and have a discussion about whether or not this is actually broad or too narrow, too broad or too narrow. So what the law says in itself is in recital it talks about online applications and e recruited purposes. So that's in the recital. So this is what European legislators think of significant effects. The Article 29 Working Party has now also issued guideline, which we already mentioned. To my surprise, might be a bit more generous what significant effects mean. It also means if somebody is offering you very costly products online, could have a significant effect. Um, all kinds of employment decisions that could have serious disadvantage to you is a significant effect. Access to health services is a significant effect. Access to education and universities could have a significant effect. And here it gets very interesting, online advertisement and differential pricing, especially if it concerns vulnerable groups, could be a significant effect where you then get all the, the, the safeguards and contesting decisions. So what would be interesting to see is, is that too broad or is it too narrow? I'm going to leave this open. But let's move on to what kind of safeguards you're going to have when an automated decision is being made about you. And the essential part is you're going to be able to contest those. So you have the right to... Um, after such a decision has been made about you, at least to obtain human intervention, as you said, there will be a human of some sort of involvement, express your views and contest the decision. Those three safeguards are um, guaranteed. So I looked a bit, a bit closer, and again, at first glance, it, it, it looks very promising, but it's not very really clear how this contesting model actually will work. I came up with at least four ideas how contesting could work, and it's not really clear which one is the right one. So. It really depends on how you see the safeguards. You have human intervention, expressing your views, contesting the decision, which you could either say as a unit, as something that needs to be enforced together. So you have, you talk to a human and then you contest it, or you can see the separate safeguards. I might as well just want to talk to a human but not contest the decision, which I think makes more sense. And then depending on how you see that, it could either mean that a human has to make the new decision, disregarding everything that the algorithm said, one idea. It could also be the decision has to be made by human in tandem with the algorithm, possibly. Or it could be you just have a human that you know has oversight of what data is going in and just rectifies erroneous data or something like that. All those four um, uh, ways will be possible according to the phrasing. 
um, it was very clear in the drafts that there should be human involvement in making the new decision. Now it just says human intervention, so it's not that clear. And it would be interesting to see what would you choose? Do you want an algorithm making the new decision or do you trust a human more? So that's an interesting debate. Who do you actually trust more, the human making the decision or the algorithm? Um, but thinking about contesting is, and why it's important in order to make sure that we have justifiable decisions is, if you go to court, are you gonna win this? That's the interesting question. And if you wanna win this, you have to have some grounds. You have to have some information or evidence to make your case. So how are you gonna get that information? And what GDPR does, in my opinion, relatively not that much. And that's a major problem because I actually think contesting will be essential for that. If you look at what Article 12.2 says, it says very clearly that the data controller should help you exercise your rights under the GDPR from Article 15 to 22. 22 free is the right to contest. So they should help you to contest decisions. So I figured, it could be interesting. What do they need to do to help make decisions, uh, to contest decisions? So I looked a bit at um, what legal scholars have to say about that, and they very much agree that essentially they have to inform you about all your rights in the GDPR. That helps you facilitate exercising them. You need to have, give them contact details to lodge a complaint, for example. You have to provide the essential infrastructure for complaints, a forum, an email address, something like that. You have to make sure that there are no bureaucratic hurdles so your complaint is actually being heard. And you have to make sure that um, the inquiry is being dealt with in a timely manner. And at some point, you need to talk to somebody who's actually the power to overturn the decision. So this is like more or less what ex helping exercise rights mean. What's interesting is what legal scholars say is there is no obligation for legal consultancy. So the data controller does not need to help you make your case. And that's interesting, right? So if you think about that helping somebody exercise their rights has mainly to do with informing them about their rights, it would be logical that they have to tell you about the right to contest decisions, right? I thought that too. They don't have to. That's a loophole. So because here it says in the, in the notification duties, and the notification duties in general mean the data controller has to inform you about all your rights, the right um, to rectify your data, delete your data, access to your data, to lodge a complaint, all of that. Interestingly enough, they don't have to tell you about the right to contest because it says here, existence of automated decision making as referred to in Article 22.1 and 4, not free. And free would be the right to contest, and that's interesting. Actually, that was proposed to make, uh, during the trial negotiations, to make it refer to everything, was taken out. That does not mean you don't have the right to contest. You do have it. You might not know about it, and that's maybe a problem. And also, you're not really being informed about your right not to be subject to an automated decision from which you could infer a right to contest. If I have a right that you don't make automated decisions about you, it's logical that I can contest it if you do. But if you look at the phrasing, they don't have to tell you about that either, right? They just have to tell you about the fact that they're using automated systems. So that's a problem, and I think a loophole that should be closed um, because you need to know about your rights to contest. Otherwise, it's gonna be meaningless. Or you super um, legally savvy and you know about your rights all along, but I doubt that everybody does. More on the question of what information do they need to give you to, to make your case? And here we have some indication what's in recital 60. And in here in recital 60, it says, data controllers should give you any information necessary to ensure fair and transparent processing. This is very vague and broad, but you could say like contesting is obviously something that ensures fair and transparent processing, which could be very helpful, but it's in a recital. And as we said, recitals itself are not legally binding, so what will happen is they will be tested in court, um, what that actually means. And also, interestingly enough, during the drafting, they proposed to make this legally binding, was not adopted in the end. Again, a problem. Um, so we have that here, we'll see how this plays out. You might have a very tedious way to contest decisions. It's gonna be very burdensome, but you could have it if you combine two other rights that you have. You have the right of access, or so the right to know what kind of data is being held about you, and you have the right to rectify it if it's wrong. You could enforce both of them and use it to contest decision if you're clever, but if you go to a data controller and ask him what data are you holding about me, you're gonna get back millions, millions of data points and you have to go through all of them and see if it's actually accurate and that's gonna be tedious. So even though I think contesting is important, I don't think that 
um, GDPR does enough to support that. Another question for me is, is ex post protection actually enough? Is it actually enough to have this mechanism? I think we should have that, but maybe we would actually need more. And I think, as you mentioned in, in the light of the recent events, we have to think about something that is maybe more likely to be like an ex ante protection. Because automated decision making and profiling has to do with nudging, right? So you're being nudged to do something that already happened. If you contest the decision afterwards, you might already have bought that thing that you didn't want to have, right? If you think about the idea of attention economy, that at some point, like the data platforms are trying to compete with your attention, try to make you stay on platform as long as possible. So you can contest the decision that you wasted your time. Maybe not, right? What about reputational damage? If you think about credit scoring, if a credit score is being calculated and passed on to other financial institutions, they might already have that information. You're on a blacklist. You don't know about that. You can contest it. But actually, you need something else, an ex ante protection for do that. And same comes through for financial damage. So just two examples why I think ex ante protection is actually just as important as, as um, ex post um, protection is. Obviously, we already mentioned it. I think it's going to come up a lot more today that um, example of Cambridge Analytica, right? Something happened, and if people now start contesting the decisions of what information is being shown to them, is that actually going to resolve the problem, or did the problem start way earlier, right? And the other thing that is important is not just to think about algorithms and decision making as software, but also as hardware and cyber physical systems, as Mirel said. Because what happened with Uber, right? The car crash, that was an autonomous vehicle making an automated decision and killed somebody. So I think contesting the decision might not be the remedy that we're actually looking for in those things. And maybe we need to think about other things than GDPR um, as well, which I think is important. And I think the last thing that I want to talk about is, because this is the essential, very important question is, how do we deal with AI governance in general? What role does law have? What role does ethics have? Everybody talks about ethics at the moment and how important it is. Nobody talks about the law and how important that is. And I think that's kind of interesting. My idea of ethics is ethics has a vital role to play. It tells you where problems are. It helps you interpret uncertainties or unclarities in legal frameworks. But leaving everything to ethics without regulation, that's a problem because ethics requires trust. I have to trust you, first of all, that you and my um, vision of ethics is the same. Do companies and consumers always have the same interests in mind? I have to trust you to follow some guidelines. And if you don't, there's nothing I can do about it. So we need to make sure that we actually define what has to be done by law and what can be left to ethics. And I think that's a very important discussion. Thank you.